once upon a time and back in the day, Elliot O'Donnell's friend Harry O'Mara told him the following story. After leaving school, I inherited a nice little sum of money from my aunt, who, dying quite unexpectedly, left me 20,000 pounds, 20,000 pounds and a bog oak grandfather clock. A bog oak clock, O'Donnell exclaimed. Is it something you wanted? <laughs> I, I had never seen it, Harry laughed. I fancy my aunt gave it to me as a sort of joke. It was almost as new to her as to me. She only had it a week before she died. She had bought it for a mere song from a second-hand furniture dealer in Dublin. I was living in a villa in England at the time. The clock came from Dublin to Bristol and thence by rail to Basingstoke arriving at my house at dusk. The carter who brought it had taken a dislike to the clock. He was a rough, churlish fellow. If you take my advice, mister, he growled, you'll pinch the himpish thing in someone else's garden right away. I rebuked the irate man, and with evident haste and still muttering angrily, he went and I called to my housekeeper, Mrs. Partridge, and we examined the heirloom together. It certainly was a most imposing piece of furniture, standing at least eight feet high with a large face. It towered above us, dark and shining. I asked Mrs. Partridge how she liked it, for I felt there was something weird about it, I even began to wonder if the carter was right. It's truly magnificent, she said, running her hand over its polished surface. I have never seen so fine a piece of workmanship. But, but it reminds me of a hearse. We laughed, but at the same time, I shivered. We placed the clock in the hall, opposite the front door, so that everyone coming to the house would see it. And my fiancé never passed the clock without pausing to look at it. I can't help it, she whispered. It's stupendous. It quite fills the house. There is hardly any room to breathe. It's a monstrous clock. It fascinates me. It's... More than a clock. You must get rid of it. I laughed again. Get rid of it. But I wasn't laughing later when the darkness had taken control. From the hall below, I heard the clock strike one, two, three, twelve. Hardly had its vibrations ceased before I heard a bump, bump, bump. And as I lay there, the sounds increased in intensity and drew nearer. Bump, bump, bump. As if something huge and massive was moving across the hall and up the stairs. An icy fear stole all over me. What? What could it be? This noise... This series of heavy mechanical booms, this wasn't a burglar. It reached the top of the staircase, pounded down the passage to my room, and then, with a terrific crash, it fell against my door. It was the clock, the funereal, hideous clock. I heard it ticking. The suspicion that I had entertained was now confirmed. It lived. This was no ordinary ticking. The thing breathed. It spoke and it laughed. Laughed in a diabolically ghoulish manner. This horrible farce lasted till one. When unable to gain entrance, it gave an extra loud clang 
and took its departure. In the morning, it was standing, as usual, in its corner in the hall, and I couldn't detect the slightest evidence of animation. Now, I certainly had no reason to like the clock, but it fascinated me. I could not, I dare not part with it. The next night, I snuck down to the hallway where I could watch the clock, and I waited for midnight. I stood and listened. Tick, tick, tick. It was so unlike any other ticking I had ever heard, and it appalled me. The clock, too, seemed to become darker and more gigantic. It reared itself above me like a monstrous coffin till its grotesquely carved summit all but swept the ceiling while a pair of huge, toeless, gray feet protruded from beneath its base as the ticking changed to a spasmodic breathing, both devilish and bestial. Midnight came. There were twelve frantic clangs. The door concealing the pendulum flew open, and an enormous hand, ashy gray, with long deformed fingers, made a convulsive grab. Swinging to one side, I narrowly avoided capture, and glancing up, saw something so awful my heart turned to ice. The face of the clock was gone, and in its place I saw a frightful head, gray, gray and evil. It was large and round, half human, half animal, and beastly, beastly, with abnormally long, lidless eyes of pale blue that leered at me in the most sinister manner, a creature out of hell. For some seconds I stared at it, too frightened to even breathe. And then a sudden movement broke the spell, and I fled for my life back to my room. But, but still I, I kept the clock. It fascinated me. It, it fascinated me. But I did have it moved to the summer house. And every night I made sure that all the doors were locked and the windows bolted. For the next few nights, I was awakened at twelve by a violent ringing of the front doorbell, while the heavy crunching of the gravel beneath my window informed me the clock was trying to gain admittance. When these disturbances ceased, I congratulated myself on seeing the last of the hauntings. But then, then I heard the clock had begun to infest the lonely lanes and byroads. I soon had proof of this, for one night the vicar came to the door in the greatest state of agitation. I must apologize for this late visit, he sputtered. Indeed, I, I did not intend calling this evening, and, and wouldn't have done so, but but something extraordinary just happened. Might I ask you for a glass of brandy? Neat. I, I glanced at him with apprehension. His white face and trembling hands told the tale. He had seen the clock. Thanks awfully, he said as he emptied the glass. I feel better now, but by Jove, it did unnerve me. Let me tell you from the beginning. I have been calling at Galette's farm, which, as you know, is two or more miles from here. And the night being fine, I decided to walk home by the fields. But all was so still, and the shadows so incomprehensible, I had half a mind to retrace my steps. But disliking to appear cowardly, and remembering, I, I must confess, that I was having a roast duck for supper, I climbed the wooden fence and plunged ahead. At every step, the silence increased, 
that cracking of the twigs under my feet sounding like gunshots. Suddenly, suddenly a tall figure stalked out of the darkness and, gliding swiftly forward, took the path ahead of me. I stared in amazement, and no doubt you will think me mad when I tell you the figure was nothing human. To begin with, it was naked, stark, staring naked, and it was gray, from head to foot, a uniform, livid gray. In height, he continued, it, it must have been a good seven feet, with an enormous round head, with a shock of black hair, no ears, huge spider-like hands, and toeless feet, toeless. I couldn't see its face as its back was turned. Urged on by an irresistible impulse, I followed the thing. Striding noiselessly, it crossed several fields and entered your grounds by the back gate. It led me to your summer house, vanishing through the doorway. I cautiously approached the window and, peering through the glass, saw the creature disappear into a gigantic clock. I was as scared by the clock as I had been by the appearance of the specter. They were both satanically awful. For you see, I had recognized the clock. I recognized it. I had seen it before at Blake Castle. It had been in the Blake family's possession for centuries and was made from what was supposed to be the oldest bog oak in Ireland. And the gray figure was the phantasm that used to haunt the Blakes. The next day, the vicar and I examined the clock and discovered that the front pillars on either side of the clock consisted of two highly polished femur bones, femur bones which, although blackened through being immersed in the bog and being abnormally long, were unmistakably human, and no doubt the bones of the gray phantom. Where is the clock now? O'Donnell inquired, to which O'Mara burst out laughing again. Ha! I ship the clock and the gray ghost <laughs> to my relatives in Canada. <laughs> the moral of the story? Always look a gift clock in the face until you know what makes it tick. To be continued, perhaps...